morning, everyone. Praise the Lord for the Lord's Day, another opportunity for us to, to worship the Lord. And that is the sole reason why we're here today. And uh, it's so good to see everyone's smiling faces today. I want to welcome our guest. And uh, if you have any questions about this ministry, feel free to, to ask someone. And uh, you should have received a little uh, welcome card. Just hand that to one of the ushers or just pop it in the offering box in the back. That would be great. All right, let's go on and look at our theme verses for our this year. And they're found in your bulletin. Under the welcome section, these are our verses that our church family uh, are focusing on this year. And I hope that you are meditating on these verses and um, allowing the Lord to use His Word in your life. We'll say these verses together, starting with the reference. Psalm 37, 1 through 7. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. All right, I want to just mention in your bulletin today, the special uh, is going to be this him, his robes for mine, and so it might be unfamiliar uh, to many of us, and so the words are there, and uh, excellent words, of course, uh, really as we observe the Lord's Supper this morning, following the morning service, these are wonderful words to, to focus on and, and to meditate on as, as well. Well, some of us might be a little more sore than usual. Uh, many of us went to Watertown Skate Express yesterday and had fun falling and tripping over people. And really, it was a great time. We really had a, a good time with fellowship. A lot came and uh, some from other churches came and other guests came that we were able to, to meet for the first time. And so that was great. And uh, we'll look forward to doing that again at another time soon. I want to just uh, remind everyone that this evening at 6 o'clock is when we have our adult Bible fellowship. We have a men's class. And we'll be finishing up our book today and the section on worship. We also have a ladies class as well. And all of our children's classes and Sunday school classes are going on too. I uh, wanted to mention also this Wednesday, of course, we have our we have a weekly midweek prayer and Bible study service. And really want to invite everyone to come to this. Uh, we meet upstairs and then we have a, a time in God's Word and also a prayer time as well. It's just a wonderful, refreshing time uh, for the family of God to be together. Uh, men, if you haven't already signed up, I think the cutoff date for the $10 is, is over, but I don't think it increased too much. I want to say it's maybe just $12 now, which is not that bad. Again, menforchristrally.org. It's not too late to sign up. I really like to fill my van. We already have several that are scheduled to come, and I'd like to see more. And so uh, let's see if we can fill the van and have as many guys as we can come to this. Again, uh, we're, we're not spending the night, but March 25th, we're going to be leaving here at the church around 1230 so that we can be there in time for the first session at 2 o'clock. Registration begins at 1. So men will leave here at the church again at 12.30 and then we'll come back in the evening and then um, Saturday morning we'll determine what time we're going to leave uh, when it gets a little bit closer. So two weeks from today we have our own missionary, missionary Eric Graham, missionary to South Africa. They will be with us. He will be ministering in the morning service and also teaching the men's class in the evening and his wife Katie, Katie Graham will also be speaking to our ladies in the ladies class in the evening as well. So be in prayer for them as they continue to travel around. We're looking forward uh, to them being here. Three weeks from today, uh, I did post a letter on the bulletin board out here, but Jacob is going to be giving his presentation for his upcoming Dominican Republic trip. Uh, that he's going to be taking in the summer. And so that will be April the 3rd. He'll be presenting uh, that morning. And then our church family is going to take up a love offering for him. We want to be a blessing to him. We want to uh, just really show our love and support for what the Lord is, is leading him to do. 
All right, well, we are here again, as I've mentioned, to worship the Lord, to praise the Lord. One way we can do that is through these hymns that we're singing. In praise to Him, think about the words as we sing. Chuck. As you turn to page 62, uh, I did not go to the skating. How many went to the skating? Raise your hand. As Pastor mentioned, how many had fun tripping and, and, and tripping over each other and all that, falling down? Really, you had fun. I, I missed that, so I guess I'm gonna have to go next time. It's like I had so much, so much fun on the on the, on the wheels. I like the four wheels when you can go behind the wheel and, and steer it instead of on the wheels on the with your feet. But anyway, we're here. Let's crown with mighty crowns. Sing that. Uh, let's all stand as we sing the first, second, and third. And between the first and the second, I'll have you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you made it on time on this daylight savings time. I'll wake you up. We're on the first. Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example 
that ye should follow his steps. And then, of course, speaking of Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes or wounds ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Let's go before the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the good news of salvation. How that any boy or girl, man or woman in this room can be saved by admitting, acknowledging that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. They admit their sin. They have a, a, a mental change in their mind. They repent about that sin. And they turn to you for salvation. And they place their faith in what Christ alone did for them on the cross. Lord, that is our desire here this morning, every Christian's desire, so that if there is someone in here like that, that today would be the day of their salvation when they acknowledge they are a sinner and turn to you alone for salvation. Father, we do thank you for our missionaries. We thank you today for uh, J.J. and Valerie Shalashenko serving in France. We pray for them that you would encourage them daily. We ask God that they would be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. Father, we also thank you for the Grams. We look forward to seeing them and many of us meeting them for the first time in two weeks. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to give them safety as they travel around um, uh, ministering in various of their supporting churches. And Father, we do ask that you would uh, help them as they are on furlough, that you would continue to provide for all of their needs. Lord, we thank you for our Church of the Week, Bethlehem Baptist in Barocco. We ask that you would be with Pastor Matt and Megan Weber. We pray for them, Lord, that you would encourage them as they are fairly new to this church and ministry. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, sustain them by your grace, remind them often of your calling on their lives. Father, we also pray for the military, uh, those who have family in our church. We uh, pray for them that you'd be with Anthony and for Jacob, for James. Lord, that you would remind them that others are praying for them today. Help them to be able to draw near to you and you have promised to draw near to them. I pray, Lord, that they would open your word today and be, com uh, and, and be challenged and comforted by the scriptures. Father, we also pray that you would be with our country. We pray for our president, President Biden. We pray for our vice president, Kamala Harris. We pray for our governor, Governor Evers. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, work in the, the lives, the hearts of these individuals. Lord, that they would as well see their need of Christ, that they would admit their sin and call on you alone to save them. Father, we also pray that you would be with other countries who are being, who do not have the freedoms and are being persecuted for their faith. We pray today that you would be with the Christians in Afghanistan, the Christians in Pakistan. Lord, that you would help them to, to continue to love their enemies, those that hate them. I pray that, that they would be able through Christ to love them and do good to those that hate them. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help the, the light of the gospel to shine brightly in these places. And of course, Lord, we pray uh, for the, uh, what is going on, the, the conflict that's going on between Russia and Ukraine. We pray for the Christians there in Ukraine and some in the outlying uh, countries as well. Lord, that you would protect them. We think today of Tim Smith. We think of others that we have mentioned before, Rebecca Fruin, uh, Daniel and his wife. We pray, Lord, that you would please uh, help them to continue to trust you no matter what. Lord, please uh, help their light uh, to continue to shine brightly for you, for your glory alone. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we grieve for many of the Christians dealing with so much there. And we just ask, Lord, that you would uh, help them to know that you will never, never leave them or forsake them. So, Lord, again, we look forward to this time as we observe and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper together uh, as a church body of believers. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to help us to have a uh, just have a stronger desire and boldness uh, to live for you. 
Father, we thank you for each person who's here today. Uh, we thank you for raising up those who uh, have been ill, not able to come. We thank you that they are back with us. Some have been traveling. We thank you that they have now returned. And so, Lord, we just look forward to what you're going to teach us through your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Two songs before the special. First one is 216. 216, let's see, the first and the last. And then go back to 209. 216, look to the Lamb of God. First and the last. Especially verse 4, marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? We'll stand as we sing all four stanzas. <laughs> Oh. 
by Julie and
I just think before we get started, I just want to thank the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much that it pleased you to bruise your Son, the Lord Jesus, to bruise him so that sinners could be rescued from their sin. Lord, we give you all the honor and praise due to your name. We thank you for your grace, which we have also sung about today. Salvation has been freely given to us. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us to be thankful for the great salvation that you have provided through your Son. And again, our prayer would be for those who have not yet received that gift, that they would do so today in acknowledgement of their sin and calling out to you alone for salvation. Father, as we look forward to spending some time now in your word and observing and celebrating the Lord's Supper, pray that we would truly remember you and focus this time on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before we turn back to Peter, I want to just briefly mention a very familiar account. If you want to turn to Numbers 21, you can. You don't have to. But Numbers 21, especially verses 4 through verse 9, we have the account, of course, and it has been repeated a lot in Exodus, Numbers, of the complaining of the Israelites. And they, they were constantly complaining about their, uh, their lack of food, uh, the food even that God provided. They complained about the manna. They complained that they did not have enough to drink. And so over and over and over, complaining, griping, and again, that was against God, verse 5, was against God and against Moses. And of course, they, uh, they said this often as well, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt, Numbers 21, 5? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Right? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth, hateth this, this light bread, right, the manna. And so we know in response to that, God hates sin. Right? He hates the sin of murmuring, and he hates the sin of complaining. Okay? And so there was some judgment. There was some chastening by God. We see that from verse 6. He sent fiery serpents or snakes among the people. They bit the people and much people of Israel died. And so the people very concerned about this that, you know, they had possibly family members dying. There were people there that they knew that uh, they, were, they were dying. And so they came to Moses in verse 7 and said, We have sinned, uh, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents or the snakes from us. Okay, people are dying. Uh, this isn't good. And uh, Moses, please do something about this. All right, pray to God for us. And so Moses prayed. Moses prayed for the people, right? Verse 7. So the Lord said this to Moses then in the next verse. So now make a fiery serpent. And verse 9 says that that is a serpent of brass. Set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh, just looks at that brass serpent on the pole, that he shall physically live. All right? He shall live. Whoever looks on that shall live. And so Moses did that in verse 9, put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent or a snake had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he looked up, ah, uh, and lived. Now, if you go to John chapter 3, you find that Jesus says these words. And if you don't have John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, by this passage somewhere, maybe you have a good study Bible, but if you don't, uh, maybe jot John 3, the side of this passage. Because here's what Jesus Christ himself says in John chapter 3. He alludes to what we just read. John chapter 3 and verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He too would be lifted up on a cross. He would be lifted up. John 3.15, he would have to die. But listen to John 3.15. That whoever believes in Him, Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so in Numbers chapter 21, you have 
individuals who were dying simply to look and then they would physically live. But now Jesus takes it a step further in John chapter 3 and says, you know what? Now you will live spiritually and also live eternally as well. And so the message title this morning is In Christ I Live. In Christ I Live. Let's go back then to what Peter said. And we're just basically focusing on one verse. Although I read several to keep it in the context, right? I read several in 1 Peter chapter 2. What encouragement... <coughs> Verse 24 is, and a reminder for us as, as well. We were reminded in the hymn that was just sung, In Christ I live, for in my place He died. And so look, if you would, at verse 23. Who, speaking of Jesus, when He was reviled, and this passage is dealing a lot with submission, even submission when you are suffering, all right? Suffering for righteousness' sake, not being foolish, uh, not just out there on your own trying to get a big name or a big following for yourself, okay? But actually suffering for righteousness' sake. And so here is our, our prime example. There's a lot packed into these verses, but we're just going to focus on verse 24. Who, when he was reviled... Verse 23, reviled not again. All right, abuse was just poured out on him. Things that were not true. Reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. That's God. And again, we know from Isaiah 53, 10, that it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus Christ. Because that was the only way that we could have our sins forgiven. That was the only way that we could live spiritually through Him. That we could live eternally. That we will one day actually physically be in the Lord Jesus' presence. Now look at verse 24. Himself, right? Who His own self. He was the only one. Neither is there salvation in any other. No other way, Acts 4.12 says. Given under heaven whereby we must be saved. One way, not through baptism, not through good works, not through a church, not through a denomination, but there's one way to be saved. To be saved. Jesus said it in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the what? I am the way. I am the way. That's right. So verse 24, he himself bore, think about the weight of our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, but look at this, should live unto righteousness. What a wonderful phrase. Being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. And here it's talking about when we have died, then, then we are able to live. And we have said, yes, I, I believe Christ. When, when you died, when you rose, I died. And when you become a Christian, that is, that is what you are saying. Dead to sin. And it's an interesting phrase here when it says being dead to sins. It's talking about uh, ceasing from existing, being taken, taken away. Being taken away, that, that desire. What it's talking about is sin's, sin's penalty. We know sin's penalty uh, is, of course, death. But we can live unto righteousness. But sin's penalty through Christ, though, it has been taken away, sin's penalty, and also sin's power. And this, then, will enable us to live to please God. When we have admitted our sin, when we have died to our sin, when we have said, yes, I'm a sinner, and I believe that Jesus died, He lived and died for me. We then are able to live unto righteousness, knowing this, by whose stripes you were healed. So we can live unto righteousness, because, number one, Christ made salvation possible. We can live to please God. We can do good works, not for salvation, but because of salvation. We can live unto righteousness. We can live unto righteousness, number one, because Christ made salvation possible. Jesus Christ died as our substitute. He took our Place. That's the great exchange uh, that was also sung about. His robes for mine. A wonderful 
exchange. Jesus Christ died as our perfect substitute. He lived a life of perfect obedience. He kept God's laws. He lived for you. Uh, he died for you. He did everything right. Really in verse 24, this is what we call the vicarious or the, uh, the substitutionary atonement. Our relationship with God is made right through what Christ did on the cross. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short. We don't measure up, so we're way short, right? We, we don't measure up to the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we know from Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin, that is the price, the cost of sin, there is a cost, it's death. And so, in the beginning, Eve, excuse me, Eve was deceived by Satan. Adam followed in that sin as well. And so their death, Romans 5, 12, passed upon all men. But we can live unto righteousness because Christ made salvation possible. Christ paid the penalty in our place. Propitiation was mentioned. Uh, atonement in the song that was, that was just sung as well. What does that mean? The death of Christ satisfied God's wrath against us. Wages of sin is death. Okay, all of us are born sinners. Okay, is there, is there some good news? Is there some help? Right? Yes, the death of Christ satisfied God's wrath. God is a holy God. He's a just God. He's a loving God, but He hates sin. And so He has to condemn us as sinners to die. He has to because He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. But He has provided in the person of His own Son, someone to take our place. Amen. Someone to die on the cross, the old rugged cross, right? To take our place. We can live unto righteousness. Number one, because Christ made salvation possible. Leon Morris wrote this, We could not deal with sin. He could, speaking of Jesus, and did. And did it in such a way that it is reckoned, we'll talk about imputation in just a moment, it is reckoned to us. Propitiation points us to the removal of the divine wrath. And Christ has done this by bearing the wrath for us. It was our sin which drew it down. It was He who bore it. Was there a price to be paid? He paid it. Was there a victory to be won? He won it. Was there a penalty to be borne? He bore it. Was there a judgment to be faced? He faced it. Christ made salvation possible. How can we live unto righteousness? A few more points. We can live unto righteousness, first of all, because Christ made salvation possible. Remember what Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And also Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Peter also alludes to that in verse 25 of chapter 2 as well. Secondly, we can live unto righteousness because Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice removes the guilt of of the believer. It removes the guilt of the believer. Because of sin, every person is guilty. Again, Romans 3.23, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. So every single human being stands guilty before God. The substitutionary then, death of Christ that Peter mentions in verse 24, is the means, is the means by which God removes the guilt of every believer. Christ took your place on the cross. I like what Spurgeon says here. There, poor sinner, and this is Jesus' point of view, listen to this. There, poor sinner, take my garment and put it on you shall stand before God as if you were Christ. As if now. As if you were Christ and I will stand before God as if I had been a sinner. Again, this is from Jesus' point of view. I will suffer in the sinner's stead and you shall be rewarded for works that you did not do. 
but which I did for you. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. His robes for mine. Look at the verse in the bulletin, Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. And listen to 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Substitution, right? Died in, in my place. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus was perfect. He kept all of God's laws. He did everything right. He did nothing wrong. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is how we can live. Through Christ, who died for us, who lived and died for us. The basis of our forgiveness is Christ's death. God didn't simply just wipe away our debt, right? He didn't just simply cancel the punishment due to the crime. Here's where I'm getting at. Someone had to pay the penalty. All right? Blood had to be shed. Blood had to be shed. Because Jesus lived and died for us, we don't have to die. Jesus paid the debt. He suffered the consequences for us. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 9, 26 says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Thirdly, we can live under righteousness, first of all, because Christ made salvation possible. That's good news. That's what the word gospel means. We can be saved, we can be rescued, we can be delivered from our sin today. Christ made it possible. Christ's perfect sacrifice removes the guilt of the believer. And then thirdly, Christ's perfect life is imputed to the believer. When we have admitted we have broken God's laws, when we have admitted we are guilty, when we have admitted we cannot save ourselves, when we have admitted that it's only Christ alone who can save us, and we repent, turn in your mind, right? Repent and believe the gospel, Jesus said in Mark chapter 3. So when we have acknowledged our sin, and we want now to please the Lord, okay? We don't want to live the life of sin any longer. Right? We don't want to live the life of sin any longer. We want to do God's will. We want to live unto righteousness. We want to live for God. We don't want to live for ourselves anymore. When that turning takes place, when we ask for salvation, when we admit to God we're a sinner, we can't save ourselves, we, we desperately need your forgiveness, when we admit that, Jesus' perfect life is imputed to the believer. Imputed simply means put that to the account. Of this person, right? You probably do it in banking, online stuff, you know, right? You've got some money and you've got a bill and that water bill is due or the electric bill and you're putting what you have to, to that account, right? You're putting that money that you have to this account. You do it all the time. You just probably never say the word imputation, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ's perfect life is imputed to the believer. The perfect Law-keeping Christ, the life of Christ, is charged to us. So by His death, we can be forgiven. And by His life, the life of Christ, we then are given a, a righteous standing. This is the only way that we can live unto righteousness. The only way. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, but again, Paul, just like Peter, speaks of, first of all, being dead to sin and then living to righteousness. Paul says it, of course, in a different way, but in Romans chapter 6, he says this, God forbid, excuse me, verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin 
live any longer therein. So again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we will never as Christians sin in this lifetime here on earth. It's not true. But that again, that penalty, right? That's what Peter says. Being dead to sins, that penalty is gone. The power has been broken because of Christ. So we are no longer going to want to sin. Yes, there are going to be times, and we have 1 John 1, 9, where we unfortunately will still choose to sin. But God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So again, going back to Romans 6, um, verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It's not possible. It's not possible for true, genuine Christians to continue in their sin. It is not possible, again, for true, genuine Christians to continue in their sin because Christ breaks that, that power. He breaks the penalty of sin. He breaks the power of sin. And so Paul goes on to continue to say in Romans chapter 6, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, speaking about our being in Christ, our immersion into Christ at salvation, were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism, Romans 6, 4, unto, into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, live unto righteousness. That's what a Christian is going to want to do. Live to please the Lord. Verse 11 says, Likewise reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. That's living, right? <laughs> alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Christ I live. Reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you say today that you are spiritually alive because of Christ? Christ in you? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Christ, excuse me, Jesus Christ is in you. Is that true today? Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. If Christ is in you today, you want to please Him. You want to follow Him. You want to do His will from the heart. It's not always going to be easy. You will fall. You will fail. You will have to ask for forgiveness from God and from others as well. But that is your heart's desire. Christ is in you, the hope of glory is in you. And you will also say, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Alright, when He died for my sin, when I accepted Him, I put my faith and trust in Him, I died. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Here I am. Right? Yet not I, but now it's Christ who liveth in me. Galatians 2.20 And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. Substitutionary atonement. Again, over and over, it's mentioned in the scriptures. So we can live unto righteousness. Not for, not for salvation. That's been done. It's done. It's completed through Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't work our way to heaven. It cannot be done. Jesus is the reason we are saved. By grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yeah. Christ, through Christ, we can live. In Christ, I live. Christ has Christ, Let me just ask it this way. Has Christ changed your life? If any man is in Christ, Paul says he is a new creation. He's a new creature. There's going to be something different. It is not going to be everything overnight, right? Sanctification is lifelong. But something's going to be up, right? Something's going to be different. There will be some type of change. Some, the Gospels, Mark, Jesus said some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 90-fold. It, it's gradual. It, it, it takes a, a lifelong. But there's going to be something different about you. Why? Or how? It's because of Christ.
Christ. We can't take any credit for this. In Christ I live. But you have to die in order to live. Right? You've got to die to yourself, die to your sins in order to live. In Christ, the Bible says, in Christ, Ephesians 1, 7, we are redeemed. I'm just going to give a brief list here of all of the, the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. In Christ, Ephesians 1, 7, we are redeemed. In Christ, Ephesians 2, 13, we are made nigh to God. In Christ, Colossians 1, 20, we are reconciled to God. Two parties being brought back together. In Christ, Ephesians, excuse me, Hebrews 9, 14, we are cleansed. In Christ, Romans 5, 9, we are justified. It needs to be declared righteous. In Christ, Hebrews 10, 10, we are sanctified. In Christ, Hebrews 10, 14, we are perfected forever. In Christ, Revelation 5, 9, we have been purchased unto God. In Christ, Colossians 2, 14, the bond that was against us has been nailed to the cross. In Christ, Hebrews 10, 19, we have boldness to enter into the holy place. In Christ, Revelation 1, 5, we are loosed from our sins. In Christ, Revelation 12, 11, we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And in Christ, Colossians 1, 20, by His cross, peace with God has been secured. And one more, in Christ, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25, through His blood, there has been established a new covenant. This is what Jesus' death and His life means to believers. In Christ, I live. Are you living now? Are you living spiritually, eternally? One day again physically will be with the Lord, with the Lord in His presence. But are you truly living unto righteousness right now? If not, why not? Perhaps is it because you still, even as a Christian, see yourself as trying to work harder and, and do more so that Christ will love you or God will love you? All right? The guilt, again, has been removed through Christ. It has been removed. Perhaps you're not a Christian. Perhaps you say, how, how could He love me? For God so loved the world, John 3.16 says. He wants you to acknowledge that you need Him as, as Savior and Lord. He wants you to acknowledge your sin and be willing to die to sin just as Christ alone died for your sins on the cross. Well, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we prepare to observe and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is for believers. It is for those who are members of the body of Christ. We have membership in our own local body here in Fort Atkinson at our church. But if you are a believer, you are a Christian, you are walking in fellowship with Him, then you may participate in, in the Lord's Supper as well. It is for sinners. It is for sinners who have been saved by grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. And let's read just a few verses here. In 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So the church in Corinth was not unified. It was not a unified church. There was a lot of disorder in the church. For there must also, verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest, made known among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, here's what was going on, everyone taketh before another his own supper. And one is hungry and another is drunken. They had, of course, the... Um, uh, the feast, which is often called the love feast, and then that would end with the Lord's Supper. So this is what was going on. 
And then he goes on in verse 12. What have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? They weren't acting like Christians, right? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is, this is symbolic, this represents, this is figurative, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show or proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so then, that's the idea here, and then, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry, wait one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together into condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when, when I come. And so there are two ordinances mentioned in the New Testament for, for Bible-believing Christians, of course. There is baptism. And both of these are, are symbolic. Baptism, of course, takes place following salvation and obedience to the Lord. It is a picture, it is a truth that says you are identifying yourself as a Christian. As Christ was, was died on the cross, he was buried, and then he rose again. That is a picture of, of our spiritual life as well. We died to sin, again. We died to sin, and we want to walk then, as we come up, right? Walk in newness of life, live unto righteousness. Again, salvation is what saves, Christ alone saves, but we are baptized because it shows a picture. I, we are showing that we are identifying ourselves as believers. You know what it's like? If you've ever had that fun experience when maybe someone, maybe a child, has taken off a, a, some labels on your cans that you just purchased. So baptism is like putting a label on a can. Baptism is just like putting a label on a can. I am a Christian. This is identifying. You know, it's very important to identify those pork and beans or whatever you're getting ready to eat. All right, I want to know what I'm eating, right? So I don't have to open up all these cans. So that's what baptism is. It's a picture. It's putting a label on a can. And of course, communion, what we are doing today, or the Lord's Supper, that is also uh, symbolic as well. Uh, baptism and communion. Again, what, what, what are we doing? We are celebrating that we are in Christ. Celebrating our union, then, in Christ. I belong to Christ. I'm not ashamed of Him. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of the Lamb. I'm, I follow the King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords, and I'm not ashamed of that. So put the label on me. I, I, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. I want to be... I want to travel the road that the Lord has for me. I want to live unto righteousness. And so just several hours before the Lord's death, this was the New Testament that the Lord instituted. And of course, He was right there with Him. All right, He was right there with Him. So they were looking at Christ when He said this. All right, so this is, this is figurative. He was not saying drink blood, his blood, right? He was right there with him. It was the cup, the juice, and then it was his body. It was bread that was broken. And so, as Christians then, we should want to live in obedience to the Lord. There were problems in the church of Corinth, and Paul said, look, you've got to get these problems ironed out. You need to, you need to take care of these issues that are going on in the church. Deal with your sin. And then partake in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And so in a few moments, we will partake of, of the bread, which again is, is symbolic of the body of Christ. We will partake of the grape juice, which again is symbolic of Christ's blood. We're not, we're not recreating what Christ already did. You know, He did it, it's done, He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this isn't a, a second crucifixion or anything like that. It's, it's been done. It's, it's completed through Christ. 
In verse 27, let's look at verse 27 for just a moment. Because there is a, a warning here, before we eat, we are going to have a time of prayer, silent prayer, where we are doing exactly what Paul says here, verse 27 and verse 28. Verse 27, he says, Whosoever shall eat his bread and drink his cup of the Lord unworthily shall be, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And so, let a man examine himself. That's what we'll do in a few moments. And then let him eat of that bread. And then let him drink of that cup. Well, how can we uh, be, be guilty, right? Like the Corinthian church was guilty. Well, maybe, maybe thinking that it's irrelevant what we're doing. Uh, it, it's unimportant. Maybe choosing to ignore partaking uh, instead of obeying. As a Christian, you're... You're, you're a Christian, you have been baptized. In other words, you say, well, is baptism in there somewhere? Do we really have to be baptized in order to partake of the Lord's Supper? A Christian is going to want to please the Lord. He's going to want to follow the Lord. I understand, especially as a dad with young children, that there is a time when maybe you might need to wait just a little bit. I seriously get that. All right, and maybe there's a time when you need to wait even uh, after salvation, hopefully not too long, but you just want to make sure. You just want to make sure of some things. But here, again, are you wanting to please the Lord? Are you wanting to live for Him? Any Christian that's saved, truly saved, they're going to want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. So how else can we be guilty? Well, it's irrelevant. It's unimportant. It's not meaningful. I'm simply going through the motions, right? Not the heart. Maybe we can be guilty by assuming this can save you. This partaking it can in no way save anyone. And then maybe we can be guilty by simply refusing to confess our sins. Saying, no, I'm not going to deal with my sins. I'm just going to partake anyway. So the Lord wants us to examine ourselves. Lord, is there anything that's going on in my life that I'm doing that's not living unto righteousness? Is there anything, Lord, in my life that, that I'm doing that, that is not a part of your plan? And I'm going against you. And I'm not going with you, Lord. I'm, I'm going against you. Is there anything? And as I've often said in the few moments that we'll have for examining ourselves, am I a Christian? Am I walking with the Lord? Is my life pleasing to Him? We'll also have a few moments where everyone's heads are bowed. Everyone is, has their eyes closed. And if you really feel the need to open your eyes and go to someone... Uh, in private, you know, quietly and quickly, <laughs> um, to say, look, I'm sorry. What I did was wrong. and um, we, we allow for the, that as well, if you feel you need to do that with someone. So the Lord suffers for believers, for those that love the Lord. We want to please the Lord. We want to follow Him. It's wonderful that the Lord's Supper is that, that opportunity for, for fellowship with, with other believers. <clears throat> who are again in Christ. It's a proclamation. What a wonderful thing that we can also focus on in verse 26. That the Lord is coming again, right? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, here's what's going on. You're showing the Lord's death till He come. The proclamation that Jesus is coming again. Are you encouraged this morning as a Christian? Are you encouraged? Let me read one verse back in 1 Peter along those lines of being encouraged. In verse 25. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now, but are now returned. There's that idea of repentant faith. You've returned unto the shepherd. He's, Christ then is our, our leader, our protector, our provider, just as a shepherd would be. Are you encouraged here this morning then? That's what Peter says. You've returned to the shepherd, and then he, he uses a term that's often used for, um, for those in leadership of the church. He says, and bishop of your souls. He's talking about an overseer there. He's talking about a guardian in Christ. I live. He then is my good shepherd. He's not a false shepherd. He's a true shepherd. I can be encouraged in my walk with the Lord. He is there to lead me. He is there to protect me. He is there to care for me, to guide me into all truth. And He is my overseer then. Christ knows the way that I take. 
And when he hath tried me, I, Job says, will come forth as gold. So at this time, we're going to have just a brief time of, of self-examination. In quiet time, people are praying, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Again, this is what God wants us to do before partaking. Before we partake, am I even a Christian? If not, today, before you leave, please speak to someone. We want to share with you some good news. All right? The wages of sin is death, yes. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's go before the Lord at this time. Our Father, we thank you for your mercies that are new every day. We thank you that you are faithful and just, willing to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're thankful that you are plenteous in mercy. Father, how thankful we are for the gift of your only begotten, your only unique Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, a life that we could never live, in perfect obedience to you. But he lived and died so that sinners could be rescued from their sin when we admit it. When we admit that we have sinned, that we have broken God's laws, and, and we, we cannot get to heaven by anything else other than Christ alone, Lord, I pray that we, if there are those here today that are in that condition, they've never trusted Christ alone for their salvation. You are not their Lord. You are not their Savior. I pray that they would acknowledge today that they need you and in faith call out to you for salvation. Father, thank you for this time of the Lord's Supper where we can remember what Christ did for us on the cross. is bloodied and bruised so that we could live in Christ we can live. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This time I'll ask for our deacons to please come. the bread out and then we'll come back they'll come back and then I'll read a verse from scripture and then we'll all partake together this time Wes would you please pray for the bread Lord we thank you for this time we <coughs> come together specifically remember the great suffering that you did on the cross how you gave your life for us that we can have forgiveness of sin that we can have the righteousness of Christ that we can have everlasting life. Pray that we would now live for Christ in all that we do and say. We ask your blessing on our time together here in your house. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
break it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Chuck, to please pray for the cup. Father, we just read that you bore our sins on your body and shed your precious blood for our sins. We thank you for that and we thank you that we can do remember this um, as we come to church um, annually, monthly, and I pray that you would just keep the cross in front of us that we might just remember and be humbled by what you have done. Thank you for this, these elements, and I pray that you would just bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um.
after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Two thirty two. That's the last song, two thirty two, when I see the blood, appropriate. I'll pass over you. So the first and the second. And the time that it's all standing is the same. First and the second. <laughs> about the good news, please talk to someone before you leave today. Uh, tonight, again, at 6 o'clock, having our adult fellowships and our youth Sunday school as well. We look forward to seeing everyone uh, again this evening. Ron and Gail, so thankful that you are back with us. Uh, Brother Ron, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together in your church. It, it help us to understand your your, your inspired word of truth, and as we go out now, we pray for understanding, but we pray for wisdom. Help us to stay focused on you, and you alone, for you are sovereign over all. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.